I promised last week that I would uh, get back on track with uh, mirroring what was mentioned here in the videos. And I sat down and had a hard time with that because I couldn't quite figure out what to write about. Um, in fact, as of about noon today, I still hadn't anything written down for a lesson plan. But I started with one thing, and through that, I got inspired to do something else. And through that, I got inspired to write this one. So hopefully this flows. What inspired me was I came across a speech, an entire speech. And when it was on the internet, it looked a lot smaller than it did on paper when I just printed it out. But it's too late now for me to change it. And it was written by Patrick Henry. And it, it ends in one of my most favorite uh, revolutionary quotes. But he was addressing the state house when they were debating whether or not they should levy a tax to support the revolution. And I copied it because the, the implications of the speech metaphorically apply to our situation now, where they were looking to revolt against England militarily. The church is now in a position of tyranny from our own people. And we need to, through action, not, not, not violence, revolt to take back our freedom. And so I'm going to read this speech, and I'll read it clearly but quickly so that we can make the time. It says, the question before the House is one, of, is one of awful moment to this country. For my own part, I consider it as nothing less than a question of freedom or slavery. As in proportion to the magnitude of the subject ought to be the freedom of the debate. It is only in this way that we can hope to arrive at truth and fulfill the great responsibility which we hold to God and our country. Should I keep back my opinions at such a time through fear of giving offense, I consider myself as guilty of treason towards my country and of an act of disloyalty towards the majesty of heaven, which I revere above all earthly things. So in other words, he's saying, I'm going to speak my mind because if I hold back my opinions for fear of offending, I'm going to be as guilty of treason to the king as I will be to God. Continues, it is natural for men to indulge in the illusions of hope and pride. We are apt to shut our eyes against the painful truth and listen to the song of that siren till she transforms us into beasts. Is this the part of wise men engaged in a great and arduous struggle for liberty? Are we disposed to be the number of those who having eyes see not and having ears hear not? The things which so nearly concern our temporal salvation. For my part, whatever anguish of the spirit it may cost, I am willing to know the whole truth, to know the worst, and to provide for it. I have but one lamp by which my feet are guided, and that is the lamp of experience. I know no way of judging the future but by the past. Are fleets and armies necessary to the work of love and reconciliation? Have we shown ourselves so unwilling to be reconciled that force must be called in to win back our love? Let us not deceive ourselves, sir. These are the implements of war and subjugation and the last arguments to which a king resorts. There is no longer any room for hope if we wish to be free. If we mean to preserve and uh, violate those inestimable privileges for which we have so long been contending, if we mean not basely to abandon the noble struggle in which we have so long been engaged and which we have pledged ourselves never to abandon until the glorious object of our contest shall be obtained, we must fight. An appeal to arms and to the God of hosts is all that we have left. They tell us, sir, that we are weak, unable to cope with so formidable an adversary. But when shall we be stronger? Will it be next week or next year? Will it be when we are totally disarmed and when a guard is stationed in every house? Shall we gain strength by irresolution and inaction? Shall we acquire the means of effectual resistance by laying sublimity on our backs and hugging the delusive phantom of hope until our enemies shall have us bound hand and foot? We are not weak if we make a proper use of those means which the God of nature hath placed in our power. Three million people armed in the holy cause of liberty, and in such a country as that which we possess, are invincible by any force which our enemy can send against us. Besides, sir, sir, we shall not fight our battles alone. There is a just God who presides over the destiny of nations, who will rise up friends to fight our battles with us. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Besides, we have no election. No choice. If we were base enough to desire it, it is now too late to retire from the contest. There is no retreat but in submission or slavery. Our chains are forged. 
Their clanking may be heard in the plains of Boston. The war is inevitable, so let it come. It is vain, sir, to extenuate the matter. Gentlemen may cry, peace, but there is no peace. The war has begun. The next gale that sweeps from the north will bring to our ears the clash of resounding arms. Our brethren are already in the field, so why do we stand idle? What is it that gentlemen wish? What would they have? Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. That was Patrick Henry, 1775. With that speech, the levy passed, and the army from that colony was formed and joined up with the regulars. It's amazing how we can look at the struggles that they were going through in nature on paper, not the specifics, but the generic nature of their struggle and apply it directly to today. The people who felt that this was their nation, that they had a right, that this was their birthright, that this was their gift from God, were being stomped out by man. The rights given to them by law were being taken by man. So we are in the middle of a national argument about this being a Christian nation. And those who have fallen prey to the, the twistings of Satan would argue the point through twisted words that our nation's laws do not mention the God of Abraham, but rather a neutral God. And this argument is valid. But what they have done is they've taken the idea and they've twisted it to present it in a fashion that makes it harder to prove. Are we a nation? Are we a Christian nation? Prove it by law. No. That was intentional. Are we a Christian nation? No. But are we a nation of Christians? Yes. Are we a nation founded by Christians? Yes. Was our nation founded by Christian doctrines and principles? Yes. So by that fact, then we are de facto a Christian nation. We shouldn't have to prove it by law because the nation's intent, the founder's intent, wasn't to sit there and force people to God. It was their intent that the Christian religion and by extension America would either rise together or fall together. Thomas Jefferson, he stated, the democracy will cease to exist when you take away from those who are willing to work and give to those who would not. We see this now happening. And I meant to extend upon that idea, and I didn't. We see this now happening, and there were other quotes that I had that must have gotten chopped out. I was telling Zach, I said, I thought this was a lot more pages than this is. I must have lost something. Um, our founders warned us. So I'll, I'll move on with that. Our founders warned us what to do, what not to do, and we ignore it. And then we wonder what happened. I'll pick up. Human rights can only be assured among a virtuous people, virtue again being Christian morality. The general government can never be in danger of degenerating into a monarchy, an aristocrat, or an uh, aristocracy rather, or any despotic or oppressive form so long as there is a virtuous uh, any virtue in the body of the people. So it goes back to the idea. Christianity and America are inevitably linked in its original identity. George, uh, that was George Washington. Patrick Henry again. Bad men cannot make good citizens. It is when a people forget God that tyrants forge their chains. A state of morals that is affected by man, a corrupted public conscious, is incompatible with freedom. No free government or the blessings of liberty can be preserved to any people but by a firm adherence to justice, moderation, temperance, frugality, and virtue, and by a frequent reoccurrence to fundamental principles. These two ideas, and there's many, many more, and I was looking for one specifically so I could attribute it, but it, it, was, uh, it was the laws of this country will only apply so long as its people remain virtuous, God-fearing citizens. I can find it when I don't need it, but when I need it, I can't find it. So I don't know who to attribute that to, but it was to, I believe it was the, one of the first Supreme Court justices said that. Regardless, you can find instance after instance after instance where the founders had 
and laid forth their intent with the understanding to the citizens that these laws were given to us by God. That the idea of the America, American nation was to be a nation of laws put to paper simply to secure them, but they were given by God. Now we look to the, the federal government to solve all of our problems. Because either someone doesn't understand the law or someone's breaking the law or we need a new law or we have to protect this, we have to secure that. But that goes against liberty. It goes against freedom. It goes against the understanding of what this nation was originally established to be. I've read this verse before, this series of verses before, but I'll, uh, I'll read it again because it applies. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. It says, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. They have nothing to do with these people. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over gullible women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. Always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. It says, they will not get very far, as in the case of those men. Their folly will be clear to everyone. So, it begs the question, is looking at this from a Christian standpoint, what do we do? Where do we go? Will this nation ever be where it once was? The answer is a resounding no. Nor should it be. We aren't those people. This isn't that time. It is not the same society. They had the same problems as us, though those are forgotten through the romanticized history. They had the same battles to fight as we do. The problems that we face as individuals are not unique to man. They are unique to us. It's the magnitude of the problem that we have to address. Ronald Reagan said this, so I'm stepping quite a few decades into the uh, future from our founders, but he said, uh, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We did not pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. Or one day we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was once like in the United States where men were free. It's a powerful statement. It begs the question, are we at that point? That's up to each one of us to decide, but the reality is, is as our lives become faster, we accelerate toward our own demise. And that's where we're at. What would take an ancient civilization years to accomplish, whether it be socially or economically, up or down, we're accomplishing it much, much faster, such as the gift of instant communication. But it brings hope. Picking up where I left off, Second Timothy now in verse 10 through 17, it says, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iseum, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from who you learned it and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. All 
all of this put together when I was preparing this, I started writing down my ideas. I was inspired. And what started off as a sentence became a paragraph, and what started off as a paragraph became half of a page. Ended up being my own speech. And, and I'll finish with this. It states, we are at a time of generational necessity where it shall once again become the destiny for good men and women to stand up for Christ. We must take action and work hard for the Lord in order to once again receive the blessings of prosperity to ourselves and our youth. Our nation is changing. It is transforming before our very eyes into something that I fear we will not recognize. The Bible says there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. And so the season of rest has passed. We are now late into the season of spring, of rebirth. Now is the time to plow, to prepare, and to sow the seeds of faith in the land that God has given us. Only then can we reap a harvest. <clears throat> Galatians 6, 9 states, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. And so I say, let us not give up. Liberty is a gift from God, given to God, I'm sorry, given to man and secured by law. Do not let this be the generation where we lose it to our own ignorance and desires. The chains of slavery are indeed once again being forged by our own countrymen. If liberty is of God, then I will repeat the words, give me liberty or give me death. For I do not want my children to live under or serve a tyrannical nation full of ungodly men. A nation that serves man instead of God will not stand, and it must not stand. So once again, I am not calling for a war, but in a spiritual sense, war is already upon us. The enemy that we have faced since the time of Eden is in our government, in our schools, and indeed in our very homes. You must each now choose your fate, your actions, and your desires, but be warned of the consequences. If those do not fall in line with the will of God, you will fail. Virtue, salvation, and grace are what will save this nation. Not any invention of man, but the remembrance that we are all creatures to a divine creator. Captain John Parker, commander of the troops at the Battle of Lexington, with a shot heard round the world was fired, in that moment said, Stand your ground, don't fire unless fired upon, but if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. Spiritually, we're being fired upon. Our enemy means to have a war and wipe us out, and that has always been his intention. This is not a war that is being fought with powder and blade, but with hearts and minds. As the pen is mightier than the sword, our enemy knows. And so to quote Romans 8.31, what then shall we say in response to these things? If God is with us, who can be against us? We have the greatest sword ever forged in our possession, the greatest words ever put to paper. We have the word of God, and through it we can emerge victorious. All we need to do is put on the armor of God, stand shoulder to shoulder with our fellow Christians, and fight under the banner of the cross. So the question is, are you willing to stand? Because when war is upon you, there is no place for indecision. Luke 11, 30, 20, I'm sorry, 11, 23 states, Whoever is not with me is against me. So the last question is, we must now choose whom we are going to serve and then do it. <clears throat>